A new growing season is around the corner and with it the promise of a delicious and productive garden. Whether you're hoping to plan your very first garden or tweak an existing one, taking the time to properly plan it out now will pay tasty dividends later on. So let's get those creative juices flowing and work out what will go where so we're ready for spring. Today I'm going to be planning four raised beds and I'm going to be showing you the process I use to get the very most from them. All the vegetables chosen are easy to grow, reliable and well suited to beginners but also prized by more experienced gardeners too. And I'll be showing you a few other things you'll need to consider later on. The first bed is for beans and peas. Why? Because these are some of the most productive plants you can grow, so they are well worth including. With the afternoon sun over there shining in this direction, I've included the peas and beans towards the back of the bed so they don't overshadow plants further towards the front. Now these climbers will need support, so for that I will include some canes supported by a ridge pole for them to climb up. The peas and beans will need regular picking, but so long as you do that, you should get a steady supply of protein-packed pods. Now there's a bit of a space here at the front of the bed, and there I'm going to include a lovely row of iron-rich spinach, one of my favourite greens. If you're in a hot climate, you could just switch things around by putting the spinach at the back to benefit from the shade of those climbing peas and beans. Let's hop on over to here into what will be a bed of potatoes. Now variety is the spice of life, so I am growing two types of potatoes in this bed. A row here of early or salad potatoes, and then here a row of main crop potatoes which will mature later on in the summer to give us some lovely potatoes for storing. Now potatoes are generally trouble free so long as you keep them well watered. But to help them along still further, I'm going to include a row of garlic between them here. Now garlic is great at repelling aphids, including potato aphid and green peach aphid, both of which can attack potatoes, so it makes sense to include them. And this is what I love about planning nice and early like this. It gives you time to hone the perfect crop combinations so you get the maximum benefit between them, something we call companion planting. And you'll notice that the beds are no wider than four foot or 1.2 meters across. And that means I can access the middle of the bed without having to step on the soil. It also keeps everything nice and tidy and well ordered, having beds like this. Now the paths are also wide enough to allow easy access between the beds, especially with a wheelbarrow, which is an important consideration when shifting barrow loads of compost about. Okay, so onto our third bed, which I am dedicating to salads. And there's a lovely row of radish, and then arugula or rocket. I've got some lettuce, and then right at the front, a row of beetroot. All of these plants will grow to roughly the same height, so they won't shade each other out. Now, what I love about this bed is that I'm going to include a lovely row of sweet alisum in between them here. Alisum is a vegetable garden flower that really works hard for the space it occupies. The frothy flowers are hugely attractive to tiny wasps and other pest predators, that will help to control aphids, something that lettuce can suffer from. This is one reason why I include this hard-working plant in various spots throughout the garden, because it really does help to keep pests down. And it flowers for months on end. Look, here's some still flowering its heart out really late in the season. Wow! The fourth and final of our beds is a bed full of sun seekers bursting with flavour. Zucchini or courgettes are well worth including because like our beans over there, these guys will keep on pumping out the fruits time and again, so long as you keep on picking, of course. Then I'm also going to include, of course, a row of tomatoes, and I will be choosing blight-resistant varieties to ensure I don't get any problems with them. And then some companion plants for good measure, including parsley for its incredible pest predator attracting qualities, and then a row of basil here. And basil is a natural companion to tomatoes, both in the garden and in the kitchen. And I'm also going to be including a few chili pepper plants at the front here and some nasturtiums. 
Nasturtiums are fabulous flowers which sprawl here, there and everywhere, helping to shade the soil while adding a welcome splash of colour. Every part of the nasturtiums are edible, including the flowers, which I love to add as a finishing flourish to a garden-made salad. If you're starting a garden for the first time, don't forget that different vegetables need sowing at different times. In our salad bed, for example, many of these guys can be sown quite early in spring, whereas zucchini or courgette needs to be started off much later, but more on that shortly. All of these plants, and especially those in the last bed, need plenty of light. Now my garden faces the afternoon sun at what is normally the warmest time of the day. That's important because sunshine is directly proportional to growth. Good amounts of sunlight mean stronger, healthier plants and faster growth. So I would suggest prioritising the sunniest part of your garden for growing your fruit and veg. You'll get that stronger growth of course and, more importantly, better tasting produce, especially from fruiting crops like tomatoes. Of course, some plants will do just fine with a little bit of shade, including leafy greens. So here's a handy table with crops divided by sunshine requirements to help you plan accordingly. But shade can be your friend too. If you suffer from exceptionally hot summers, then you might want to actually seek out an area that gets some shade during the hottest part of the day, or perhaps plan to grow taller crops that might be able to cast shade for lower growers that will appreciate the uh, cooler environment this gives. Even in a more temperate climate like mine, a little bit of shade can be useful for some things like, for example, lettuce. Lettuce can be prone to bolting in hot, dry weather, so by casting light shade, it can keep the soil cooler and moister for longer and ensure that you are picking it for longer too. Shelter from prevailing winds will help to keep plants from getting buffeted about, and if you don't have any, you can always create some. Hedges or shrubs make excellent windbreaks, but will of course take time to establish before they are dense enough to shelter surrounding plants. So in the meantime, you could use screens or, for example, taller growing, fast growing vegetables like Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. Shelter's great, but try to avoid areas with lots of overhanging branches or searching tree roots that will either cast shade or compete for valuable resources at ground level. Now that's one downside about my garden here, is that over time, the branches have grown out and cast more shade. So I will be doing a little bit of light winter pruning to knock everything back a bit to let more light in. Soil is where everything starts. Now the perfect soil is free draining, yet able to hold on to enough moisture between rain showers, but few of us have the perfect soil. So whether yours is very sandy and dries out very, very quickly, or clay and prone to winter waterlogging and then cracking, baking hard in the summer, the solution is the same. Plenty of well-rotted organic matter, such as compost or well-rotted manure. And this can just be laid on the surface like I've done here for the worms and other microorganisms to take down into the soil over time. My garden gets insanely wet during the winter months. Now there's a spring somewhere over there and after a few days of rain, well, the whole garden can turn to a wet, slippery shimmer. I found that the solution to all of this in my particular circumstance is to grow in raised beds, which drain much better in wet winter weather. Now, of course, growing in raised beds is by no means essential and growing directly in the ground works just fine too. My beds were placed onto what was originally lawn. Now I dug them into the slope of the hill to ensure a level planting surface. And that just makes it a lot easier when it comes to watering because it doesn't just run off the surface downhill. I then filled the beds with a selection of composts and we were good to go. And I've done a video on how to set up beds like this and I will pop a link to it down below. Plants need extra water in dry weather and watering will help seedlings and young plants to establish. So if you can, locate your garden close to a water source. Mine is at the front of the house, away from the garden. That's not ideal, so I use a long, extendable hose to reach around the back where the garden is. 
treated mains water works, but collected rainwater works even better and should be prioritised. So design in some water collection barrels like this. And the more the merrier. Harvest rainwater from guttering collected to the house, sheds, greenhouses, any surface area that can collect plenty of the wet stuff. Gardens produce lots of organic matter over the course of a year. Old pruning, spent crops, leaves, weeds, and all of this can be recycled back into the garden to feed future crops for free. So remember space for composting. In a small garden, this might be a simple lidded compost bin, while in a larger garden, a series of composting bays might be the solution. Whatever your situation, don't let any of this good stuff go to waste. Compost it. Storage is essential for keeping tools and equipment dry. I try to keep everything as convenient as possible so I can just grab what I need for each gardening session and crack on with it. Even if you don't have space for a full-size shed, you might have space for a simple garden store or perhaps a bench with built-in storage for your most used tools, pots and other bits and bobs. The design for these four beds has been taken from the garden planner and I've used the beginner garden plan there and adapted it to suit my space. Now you can find it there also along with a selection of other sample plans. If you don't like any of the vegetables I've mentioned, well, no problem. Just swap them out to ones you do like and the garden planner will automatically space them and work out how many plants you need for the area you have. Best of all, it will then build a personalised planting plan, showing you exactly when to sow them, plant them out, and if you like, it will even email you planting reminders to keep you on track. How fab is that? And the best bit is you can try out the garden planner completely free and you don't need to put in any payment details to do so. You'll find a link to the garden planner down below. We've done a complete guide to planning larger spaces with a wider variety of crops which you can view next. In the meantime, please do let me know what you're hoping to grow in the coming growing season in the comments below. I'll catch you next time.